Well, in Hawaii, there's none of your friends would let you get away with being a surf star. Yeah. Quote, unquote. I love Hawaii for this. (laughs) You know, they just like rip you down if you acted like that. So there wasn't any of that. Yeah. My life, you know, because if I acted stupid, I'd know about it. They'd all go, you know, start hissing and Mm -hmm. (laughs) slap me around. And, you know, I remember going to California one time for something and somebody asking me for my autograph. And I go, what do you want that for? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it was just being in Hawaii. There wasn't anything, you know, sort of stardom. Yeah didn't exist there you were just you were another surfer you know and some days you got lucky and you got good waves and a lot of days you didn't Mm -hmm. and that was it that's jerry lopez i'm jamie brissick and this is soundings brought to you by the surfers journal The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 120 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Jerry Lopez is a Hawaiian-born surfer, shaper, writer, and film actor. In the annals of surfing, there is no wave rider so synonymous with a single surf break. Jerry Lopez and Pipeline, or as he likes to call it, The Pipeline. I grew up with his pictures on my wall. In the 1980s, I read his pieces in the magazines. Some were presented in his distinctive handwriting, which looked a little bit like his surfing. They were clean, they were written in all caps, and they had this stylish slant to them. He's a co-founder of the legendary Lightning Bolt Surfboards. He played himself in the movie Big Wednesday and also the character Subotai in the film Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 2008, he authored a book, Surf is Where You Find It. He's the subject of The Yin and Yang of Jerry Lopez, directed by award-winning filmmaker Stacy Perelta, which came out in 2022. In the 80s, when I first started going to the North Shore, Jerry owned a beautiful beachfront home that looks straight into the barrel of Pipeline. I thought, that makes perfect sense. Today he lives between Bend, Oregon and Baja, California. We met at neither of those places. He was in town to do some shaping, so we met at the Hampton Inn in San Clemente, a stone's toss from the busy Five Freeway. Can you remember the first time that you surfed the Pipeline? I do. I vividly remember it. Tommy Chamberlain and I, who was one of my surfing partners in high school, he ended up on Kauai, but um, we were sophomores in high school, so probably about, I don't know, 13 or 14 years old. We were on our way to a class picnic out in Haula, right across from Pounders Beach, Mm -hmm. but Tommy had the bright idea the day before, hey, well, let's go out through the North Shore. Well, the country. Nobody called it the North Shore back then. This was in 1963 or 64. Okay. So we drove out, you know, through Wahiwa, and Haleiwa was flat. And thought we were going to surf Chun's Reef, and it looked pretty small. And I don't think Tommy wanted to stop there anyway, because we had surfed those places before. So we went straight to the pipeline, which um, back then were... The beach park is now is uh, was just an empty lot, and he had a Morris station wagon that the surfboards would fit in the back. These long boards back then. We both had Wardies, and we stopped there, and we got out right there where we could see the ocean and saw this perfect I don't know four foot wave breaking. It was glassy. It was a beautiful day. There was not one single person on that entire beach. And we grabbed our boards and ran down there and we paddled out and it was just this perfect pipeline. And we were the only guys on that entire stretch of beach and we couldn't make a takeoff. We tried and tried. Every time I stood up, you know, those boards were pretty flat back then. I'd pearl 
and swim to the beach and tell me it was the same thing, you know. And finally, we just like gave up, just left the boards on the beach and we're body surfing. And then we spied this guy paddling out. He was sitting on his board, paddling out. He had a coconut hat on. Finally, he got up to us and it was Jock Sutherland, who's the same age. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we knew him more by reputation than actually never really formally introduced. But he took the place apart. I mean, hmm. he was so good already because, you know, he grew up there mm -hmm. right at Chun's Reef. I think he was really the first kid to grow up surfing on the North Shore. Mm. And he was really, I mean, his whole game was really advanced. And finally he, you know, said, why don't you guys go get your boards? And we went, okay, you know, and we went out and purled a couple times in front of him. <laughs> he said, why don't you take off at an angle? You'll have better luck. That was really the, the key thing that launched me on my whole quest at the pipeline. Wow. Because that was uh, what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And I made a few takeoffs. And from that first session, did you have a sense that it would be become such a big part of your life? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. I think surfing in those days was smaller. The thinking was smaller. And there wasn't really any kind of planning or deep thinking about what you were going to do. There was a whole different attitude from especially what it is today, you know, mm -hmm. where parents are planning their children's surfing careers yeah, yeah. even before they're born. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's incredible. Do you think it was smaller than because there was it wasn't a career there wasn't a viable career path? Or was it because it was basically like designated as a recreation but not something that you could actually make work professionally? Well I think certainly that was a big part of it, but I think it was even much more than that is that surfing itself there were so few people doing it and, you know, the perception of it from like my parents' standpoint was that we don't want our kids to grow up to be surfers. These guys are bums, you know, they're living in their cars. If they have a car, they're sleeping on the beach and yeah. they're, none of them are working, you know, they're not contributing anything. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going from that time when you first surfed pipeline on longboards and then you you experience the shortboard revolution where the boards probably fit at pipeline a lot better than the big, long, clunky, cumbersome boards did. What would, that, that period seems so exciting to me. I mean, the idea of sort of the boards going shorter and then and then riding in new places in the wave, i.e. The, the tube at pipeline. Well, you know, the first time that actually happened, you know, I became... Um, pretty friendly with Jock, and Jock was, as we got older, you know, into um, our college years, the later 60s, well, later, <laughs> 67, 68, he, you know, his surfing had continued to evolve and especially advance, or he was one of the top surfers, and he was... Uh, a uh, writer for Dick Brewer, who was making the pipeliners with Bing back then, which, you know, in my opinion, were really the zenith of that longboard period that started in, you know, the foam surfboards in the mid 50s, mm -hmm. going into what later became known as the shortboard revolution. So they were really the the best longboards, you know, that I ever rode. Mm -hmm. And Jock had two of them, and he would loan Buddy Dumphy and I. He had a 9.5 that he rode in the World Contest in San Diego um, when he got second behind Nat, mm -hmm. you know, which everyone said, well, Nat killed it. The actuality was that uh, Jock was a pretty close second. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he was riding this 9.5, kind of a nose rider style 
pipe liner. It had black and white slip check on the nose. He really liked that board, but he had this 9.4 pipe liner that was really sleek and thin and really a beautiful board. And he would loan that to us all the time. So, you know, that was really the first board that I wrote at the pipeline because we, when we borrowed his board, we'd only go out to places that never like Rocky Point or, you know, someplace where there was rocks on the beach. Mm -hmm. This was long before leashes. Right. <laughs> you know, we had a borrowed board. It was Jock Sutherland's board. You didn't want to ding it. Yeah. So um, we'd surf Valsey Land or, or Pipeline or, you know, Chun's Reef or someplace like that. Um, where you could be sure <laughs> you know you weren't going to lose the board on the rocks, and that was really the first time that I wrote a good board at the pipeline, and really the second time after that, uh, where I had a board that I really felt confident on at the pipeline was in nineteen late nineteen sixty seven. Actually, the 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 whole story is that. I was surfing one day on Jock's Pipeliner at the lefts at Valsyland, and Brewer paddled out, you know. And this is Dick Brewer? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, he, he's a goofy foot, so we're surfing the lefts, and, you know, he goes, you like that board? I go, yeah, I love this board. This is, you know, the best board we've, we've ever rode, because Dumphy and I would take turns with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd catch a few waves. And then if I lost it, you know, then he would paddle out and I'd swim in and wait for him to lose it or or he'd catch a few waves and come in again. And so it was my turn. And, you know, I guess Brewer saw me catch a couple waves on it and then he paddled out and asked if I liked that board. And I go, yeah, I really like it. You know, I love it. And he goes, just like out of the blue, he goes, well, I could make you one. Hmm. And I went, Really? You know, I mean, this is Dick Brewer. Yeah. Shaver to the stars. And, yeah. Um, yeah, he goes, get a blank and come over to Maui because I'm moving over there. I'm going to start shaping in Lahaina. So Reno and I got these blanks. We bought these reject blanks from uh, Fred Swartz at Surfline Hawaii, mm -hmm. Clark Blanks. And, and yep. Reno Abalera. Sorry? Reno Abalera. Reno yeah. Abalera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we flew over to Maui, you know, checked the blanks in <laughs> as our luggage. I think I had a paper sack, a Hawaiian Samsonite with a couple of T-shirts and a pair of shorts. And um, we hitchhiked to Lahaina from Kahului. Brewer was there, and he shaped Reno's boards first, you know. And Reno got this sleek kind of pipe liner. It was a 9.8 beautiful gunny looking thing you know and i went yeah that's what i want too mm -hmm. and we were you know waiting and, or i was waiting and waiting for brewer to shape my board and you know he kept putting me off and finally he said this is about a week later he goes okay i will shape your board you know in the morning and so we were waiting down there at the cannery where the shop was and and uh he showed up you know, and I had my blank, and right then this car pulls up and had all these surfboards piled on the roof, and it was uh, George Greeno was driving, it was Nat Young, the two Witzig brothers, okay, Russell Hughes, and Bob McTavish. Uh huh. Incredible. And McTavish and Brewer started talking. You know, I think we smoked a joint or something, and they started talking about surfboards, and they had those wide-tailed, deep V-bottom boards. After about an hour, you know, finally Nat and the other guys go, come on, let's go surfing or something, you know. So they left, and then Brewer was all excited, you know. We went to the shaping room, and I go, okay, I want one just like Reno's, you know. And the blank was, I don't know, 10 feet or something. He gets a saw, and he saws his foot off the nose, you know. And I'm going, RB, I want a 9.8. He saws a foot off the tail, you know, and I'm going, <laughs> oh, man. And he was just, like, totally into it. And he had this idea, and he made this 8.6, which was, like, an unheard of mm -hmm. 
length mm-hmm. at that time, you know, right. for us. Yeah. You know, that was way too short, you know. And he had this idea and V in the bottom, you know. And he made this board that was unlike anything any of us had ever seen, you know, and ended up, I think his wife at the time, um, Betty, said, let's call them mini guns. Hmm. But this was much later, uh, you know. And so he, I had, Reno had his beautiful looking 9.8, and I had this kind of wide nose, pintail, other board. But that board was, you know, f- there actually was a short board revolution. It ended up that that board was maybe the first shot fired in it, at least wow. in our group in yeah. Hawaii. And everybody who rode that board went, I got to have one like this. And mm-hmm. there was a surf contest at Hali Eva, um, and all the guys, the good guys, belonged to this branch of the Wind and Sea Surf Club back then. It was Jeff Hackman, Kiki Spangler, Jimmy Lucas. Um, God, I can't even remember all the guys now. But at the contest, they all rode that board of mine. Hmm. And they all did pretty good. And they all came in and went, oh. Because they were all brewer team riders. Mm-hmm. You know, they were all mm-hmm. riding. They had their own pipeliners. And they go, no, we want one of these. And later that afternoon, um, a friend of mine from the South Shore, Timmy McCullough, his dad um, had Wren's um, menswear, you know, his Aloha shirts and um, fine men's clothing. But Timmy was my age, and he was a photographer, too. And he goes, let's go down the pipeline, because the pipeline's always good when Holly Eva's good. Mm-hmm. And so we went down there, and there was nobody out, but there were some good waves, you know. And he goes, go out there. I want to take some pictures. And that was the first time I went out on that 8.6, and okay. those were the first pictures I ever had of myself surfing the pipeline. And um, that board worked really good out there, and that was really – the beginning of me thinking, I kind of like this spot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everywhere else is a right. Yeah. This one's a left, man. Yeah. And um, that was kind of the beginning for me at the pipeline. Wow. Did that sort of gain momentum? Did it become a thing where you would keep going back there and then go home and think about it? And I mean, I'm just curious about how your um, probably more than any surfer and break in the world, Jerry Lopez and the pipeline are sort of this synonymous thing. And it's so iconic. In fact, I lived in New York for a long time and on my wall in the Lower East Side was a picture of you, a Jeff Devine picture of you in the barrel at Pipeline. Oh. Um, what was it like as you sort of built this relationship with the break that would be, you know, there, there are relationships with certain places, but the fact that it's this, what what is one of the most deadly surf breaks in the world one of the most beautiful surf breaks in the world and, and, um, and dangerous, you know, what was that like? Well, you know, it was really all revolved around the surfboards because, you know, it was that eight, six brewer that first kind of set me on the path. And because that surfboard was so popular with everyone, you know, when I asked when, and it was pretty lightly glass when it was starting to get beat up, you know. I asked RB, you know, hey, I, I need to get another board. <laughs> and there was no way, you know. He had a waiting list so long. So that's when um, my friend and I, Buddy Dumphy, you know, he goes, Buddy suggested, well, let's just make our own boards. Mm-hmm. And I go, we don't know how. And he goes, well, you watch him make this board. Didn't you? And I went, you know, put me on the spot. And I went, gulp. I, I guess I did. And he goes, well, we can do it. And we did, you know. So we ended up, we both started making our own boards mm-hmm. right there. And wow. and then that, you know, transferred into um, me trying to make boards, well, to ride anywhere, but especially to ride the pipeline because Mm -hmm. the pipeline was not a popular spot Mm -hmm. in 1968. Yeah. 
69, you know, I mean, it had a brief thing going where, you know, after Phil surfed it and, you know, then Butch and, and um, John Peck mm -hmm. started, you know, really doing some stuff there. But that was when the pipeline also kind of garnered the reputation of being pretty deadly, you know, yeah. that the Peruvian kid got killed out there and um, a lot of guys got beat up, you know, and it broke more surfboards than any of the other surf spots. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, guys just kind of went, ew. And mostly people were surfing Sunset. You know, mm -hmm. that was the place where the waves were always bigger and better and that's where all the good surfers were. Mm -hmm. And um, so the pipeline was kind of empty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kept making boards there and um, spending time there and breaking the boards in half and going home, trying to create a new board that would work better and, Eventually, you know, that evolved into one eight foot pintail that um, I started having a lot of success on. Mm -hmm. And once I had a board that worked out there, then I really started locking into the place, you know, and all that stuff about it being dangerous and everything really, I don't know if it really played into any of my thinking, you know, as I was approaching it or how I was approaching it. I was just trying to figure out a way to ride it. Yeah. And, you know, to get in the tube and come out. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, the boards just didn't let that happen. Mm -hmm. The surfboard designs were holding us back. Yeah. And it wasn't really until I made that that eight foot pipeline board that we ended up uh, naming the Coral Cruiser mm -hmm. um, hmm. that I figured out that wow I got a board that I can get in the tube and <laughs> it's going to keep going it's not going to stop and throw me off you know and mm -hmm. and uh, that was really the the real turning point for me as far as okay, <laughs> I kind of like this spot now. Yeah. What was it that you liked? What was it that you connected with? Was it getting tubed? Was it picking the right wave? It was intense, you know, and, mm -hmm. and there was something really special about it. You know, I thought about it a lot that, you know, a lot of people were scared of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I'm sure, you know, I was too at some point because you'd be paddling out, you know, the channel there, looking at these waves, just going, how are you possibly yeah. going to make a drop on a wave that steep and that hollow mm -hmm. and, you know, hope to have any success in riding it? And that was the whole thing, you know, you had to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. But in the process of figuring that out developed this kind of um a harmony yeah with it that where i felt comfortable doing it and right about in 1968 when i really started to get serious about surfing you know i started the first time i went surfing was 1958 okay but <laughs> i think it took me about a decade to figure out that I really liked it and wanted to get serious about it. Mm -hmm. And right at about that same time was when I um, yoga came into my life. Right. And, you know, yoga, I mean, even today I look at it and kind of giggle because, you know, if you have any deep questions about the purpose of life or, you know, what are we here for? Yoga has all the answers, and they've had them for a long time, you know, thousands of years. Yeah. And one of those questions was, okay, how am I going to find some kind of peace within this life, you know, this mm -hmm. pursuit of mine in surfing? And the peace was um, finding some kind of harmony with the natural world, which, yeah. you know, my 
pretty much entire natural world was focused around the pipeline. Incredible. It's an it's kind of an amazing metaphor when you think about it in the sense of um, here's this wave that is the physics don't make sense. As you said earlier, it's so steep. It's so hollow. It's like, how do you even get down the face of that? And then the lip smashing on the shallow coral, et cetera. There's so much about it that is just this chaos. And you, there was a sort of um, a relaxation amid all this. You know, your style was always so relaxed, your shoulders and your arms. There was a minimalism that you brought to it at a wave where typically your nervous system would be just flying, right? <laughs> I have two questions. How did you find the yoga in the first place? And then did you, do you feel like the yoga helped you to sort of calm that down? Yeah, I mean, because yoga has been such a long time part of my life, and, you know, I've come to realize, because I've taught a lot of yoga as well over the years, that one of the most interesting things is that yoga, kind of like surfing, comes into a person's life only when it's supposed to, uh -huh. when they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can try all you want before that moment, and it ain't going to happen. And, you know, I watched that with surfing with my son, you know. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested in it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he was. And it was the right time. Yeah, You know, the whole thing about the pipeline was, like you said, there's all this, you know, turmoil and, <laughs> and stuff going on, you know, and there's explosions all around you. And you had to, to be at peace with that, you had to find a stillness there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that I, you know, got lucky and, and was able to find that pretty early on. Yeah. And when everyone else was still struggling to find that same, you know, sense of stillness for themselves there. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that, you know, I got to put in quite a few years there when nobody else was interested in it. Right. You know, nobody would even come down there. I mean, a lot of times I'd go down there, you know, and Billy Hamilton had the house right there on the beach, kind of the, the where Jamie O'Brien's house is now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe he'd be working on a surfboard and under the banyan tree, you know, and I'd come by and i go, how's the waves? He goes, I don't have a look. Let's go look, you know, and we'd go out there and look and there'd be nobody out there and, you know, see one or two good waves and, well, I'm going to go out. And he goes, all right, let me just finish this board. I'll come out and join you. And there were so many days like that, you wow. know, it just maybe handful of guys would show up at all mm -hmm. and um there were so many days where you know i'd go down there and look and it was not that great but i'd see one good wave you know and i'd go well i'll just go out there and wait for that wave mm -hmm. and so there were many days where no one came out yeah and so you know all that time added up that i began to understand that place a little better and feel comfortable out there and yeah you know have a little confidence that um it wasn't going to kill me mm -hmm. and um you know that kind of added up so right plus you know like i said i mean it all started with having a good board for that wave when you were at your peak in terms of your relationship with the pipeline what did that feel like i mean to have that um connection with the surf break can you recall sort of some of your best waves ever at the pipeline? No, I can't remember any of them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I thought about that as well because I wondered why, you know. I mean, you'd get a great wave, and at the end of the wave, I'd ask myself, wow, what happened? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of blank. Yeah. And, again, the answer came from yogos because you know i was so into that moment so focused and concentrating that my mind was blank yeah and you know i was just being there yeah and then when that moment ended <laughs> that blank was still there in my mind and you know a lot of times i try and remember what happened and you know then i remember oh yeah there was a guy paddling out and then 
oh, yeah, I had that, you know, little slip on the takeoff and something like that. But honestly, today, I can look at all the, the pictures that came from that time. I don't have any recollection at all of those waves. That's so incredible. But, you know, I practice yoga as well. And a lot of the yoga teachers that I've practiced with will talk about how the most difficult posture of all is Shavasana, which is the stillness. Exactly. And uh, there's something similar with Pipeline, I think, because there are a lot of great surf breaks around the world, Jeffrey's Bay, Rincon in Southern California, et cetera, where there, you know, Sunset Beach, there's a lot of strenuous stuff that goes on. And Pipeline is like so stripped down to just this minimalist positioning, picking the right line and letting the wave kind of do everything else. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, really sums it up. And um, that was it for me, you mm -hmm. know, that the wave did everything. All I did was just stand there. Yeah. So, so extending that, which is super interesting. So you did this thing and then all of a sudden the pipeline is the most famous surf break in the world. You're the most famous surfer in the world. And you're doing this, this thing that is, economy of movement minimalistic in every way doing nothing <laughs> doing nothing and you can't even remember these waves that you've ridden and yet you you walk off on the beach and and you and you're mr pipeline what what, what was that like what how, how did it feel to be kind of um a famous surfer at that time well in hawaii there's none of your friends would let you you know get away with being a surf star yeah <laughs> quote unquote i love hawaii because, for this <laughs> you know they just like rip you down if you acted like that and so there wasn't any of that yeah in you remain humble you my were, life yeah. you know because if i acted stupid i'd know about it they'd all go you know start hissing and mm -hmm. <laughs> slap me around and you know i remember going to california one time for something and somebody asking me for my autograph and i go what do you want that for mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, that was, like, kind of shocking to me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, going to Japan and having them all want to take their picture with me, mm -hmm. you know, that was even more shocking. I yeah. Was, wow. Yeah. I think, you know, it was just being in Hawaii, there wasn't anything, you know, surf stardom. Yeah. Didn't exist there. You were just, you were another surfer, you know, and some days you got lucky and you got, good waves and a lot of days you didn't mm -hmm. and that was it yeah and, you know all of a sudden there was this whole other world that grew up you know in a lot of ways about me that i didn't really know anything about mm -hmm. and it was just kind of separate from my own life right this time that we're talking about was sort of the birth of surfers getting paid to surf right it, it becoming a thing and i would imagine at some point you were probably relative to those times that you were getting paid really well well actually no because you know the first guys to suggest that um they were going to get paid to be surfers was well the aussies and sean thompson mm -hmm. you know peter town and yep. um ian cairns mm -hmm. you know they go, we're going to be pro surfers and they're going to pay us, you know. And I go, you guys are dreaming. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to pay you to go surfing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they were right and yeah. I was absolutely wrong. I just, you know, for the longest time, couldn't believe that something like that would happen. And really the first Hawaiian surfer to actually start getting paid to be a surfer was Larry Bertelman. Oh, yeah, I remember was, that. was, you know, much younger than me. Mm -hmm. And we were, like, really happy for him and proud because he was the kind of guy that wasn't going to get any other kind of job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here was someone that, you know, was actually legitimately getting paid to go surfing. Yeah. I mean, Barry Kanayapuni and I, we built surfboards. You know, we shaped boards. And so we kind of had a job especially in our minds, you know, that well, this is how we're going to get our money to go surfing and, and, you know, to go travel to like Australia and support this budding professional surfing circuit. Mm -hmm. I don't think either of us ever entertained the thought of winning 
one of those contests, you know, and tiny little two foot Mona Vale blown out surf. Yeah. But I guess we just went to be supportive, mm-hmm. you know, to, to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And you did end up winning contests, right? And you did, um, did you like competition? Well, I wasn't very good at it, mm-hmm. you know. So I guess, I mean, I enjoyed the, the events, but I really wasn't thinking I was going to win. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I tried as hard as I could, but I just, I didn't have that mindset. I remember, you know, Jimmy Bleers was a good friend of mine. We went to high school together. Him and um, Jeff Hackman were in the same grade. They were a year behind me. They graduated in 67. and um, He was the one that always did really well in the contest. You know, we had the little local amateur contests, and I could never figure out, I go, how come you always do good in the contest? And, you know, none of the rest of us ever do. And he goes, oh, I don't know. And he was just, it wasn't like he was super competitive because he was really a mellow guy, but he figured out, the game, you know, he figured out the rules. He knew exactly, okay, he had to catch so many waves in a heat. You know, he had this much time, mm-hmm. and he kind of had it all plotted out in his mind what he was supposed to do. And his results, you know, pretty much showed that that was the way to do it because mm-hmm. he won or placed well in more contests than anybody else in, you know, that period of time. Right. And, um, you know, those Australians and the guys that did really well in those, you know, when we started the professional thing, they were the same mindset. You know, they were um, they were there to win contests. Mm-hmm. And really the first Hawaiian surfer to really figure it out of, okay, what do I have to do to win heats was Michael Hull. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, I thought a lot of us were pretty good surfers, but surfing in a contest to win was an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. And it was Michael that, you know, really put his mind to figuring out exactly what he had to do. And, you know, Derek was, they were very close, Michael and Derek. And so Michael, passed on all that knowledge to Derek, who ended up becoming the first Hawaiian world champion. Yeah. But they would, you know, because a lot of those contests were in crappy little waves, they would go, you know, when the surf was good, they would go over to the east side and surf at like Goat Island or yeah. someplace just to practice in sure. shitty waves. And, yep. you know, we were really unsuited for that because – we only went surfing when the waves were good. Mm-hmm. You know, we always surfed offshore or there's a South shore, you know, in the summertime where the country in the winter, <laughs> the wind was always offshore. The waves were always perfect. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> the surf was onshore and blown out. None of us would go surfing. And most of the contests in the very beginning were in waves just like that. Yeah. I remember that. The pipeline being on the north shore of Oahu and that being primarily winter, what would you, in the summertime, were you at Ala Moana? Ala Moana. Yeah. 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 Always Ala Moana. Mm-hmm. And Ala Moana had, you know, even more of a surf culture than mm. than the pipeline. Yeah. 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 I remember when, it, I think one of my earliest surf pictures, which I had on my wall, also had on my wall, I would have been 13 or so, was of you doing this beautiful top turn at Alan Wannett, right at the end bowl, it looked like. Oh, yeah. It was a poster that Surfer sent in, and it was just called, it just said Alan Wannett. It was, it was about the break, and then I realized it was you. At least that's how I ordered it from the magazine, but yeah. I remember it so vividly, and it was this, this beautiful carve off the top. Yeah, that was a John Severson shot, and it was one of those funny days that you could get away with, you know, this that would have been, I think, 72 or something like that where it was a Saturday Mm -hmm. and I went down to the beach and, you know, my regular surfing partners, one of them was off doing something else. And the other one, I don't know, had to go to the dentist or something like that. He had a toothache. And 
I got down to the beach and no one was there. Hmm. You know, and Alamana was usually the most crowded spot on the South Shore, especially if it was pull sets, you know, mm -hmm. and the waves were going off. And um, I remember paddling out and being the only one sitting out there in the bowl and looking over at Magic Island, seeing a photographer over there. And, and that was um, Sivo, you know, he was came over from Maui and he got that one shot. And wow. was, we laughed about it a long, many years, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, thinking about how funny that was. He came to shoot Alamoana and there was no one there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's one guy out. And, Such an iconic picture. When you think, when you reflect back on all your years of surfing, what um, what's the most meaningful? What stands out the most? Hmm. Meaningful. Wow. <laughs> Well, I guess let me let me frame that. So you so you have this relationship with Pipeline, but then I know you've also done a lot of trips to Indonesia. Mm. You were early on at Grajigan, G Land. Um, I mean, you've ridden some of the the great waves in the world, and you've and you've you've done that for most of your life. And I guess I'm, I always ask it's such an abstract question, but what does it all mean? What is it? What is it? Where does it? Um, where do we? What do we do with it? Well, I really believe that it's something that is not easy to continue doing mm -hmm. because for whatever reasons, you know, you lose interest, you, you get out of shape, you let it go just a little too long, that, you know, passion or desire just kind of fades away. I've had a lot of friends that have just kind of gave up, you mm -hmm, know, and I mm -hmm. could never really understand because it always, uh, just surfing always brought me such joy yeah, and um, a sense of, of completeness that if I'm surfing, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And um, as long as I keep surfing, I'll stay alive. One of the things that's been interesting for me is that you know, for a long time, because, you know, I had the practice of yoga in my life that I thought that they were pretty similar, you know, maybe even parallel paths. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as time has gone on, I mean, shoot, I've been surfing, well, since I was 10 years old. It's like, <laughs> this year will be 65 years. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've come to see it as maybe yoga and surfing are the same path mm -hmm. and that maybe the Hawaiians were really onto something a long time ago. What the Hawaiians call mana, they're describing this spiritual energy that exists in all things and animates all life. The yogis call that same energy prana. And I've often found it so intriguing that these two cultures on opposite sides of the world completely separated from each other in almost every way have almost the same word mm -hmm. for this thing, this part of life that turns out to be maybe the most important thing in our existence. And now I think that you know, maybe that those Hawaiians, you know, finding that path to a higher consciousness, the yogis do it through deep meditation. Well, in order to surf successfully, if you don't have a meditative state of mind, you're going to be swimming after your board. Yeah. And um, I mean, I always felt that the first 20 years of surfing was just a test to see if I was really interested in mm -hmm. this thing that I was doing. And, you know, once I kind of got a passing grade in that test, you know, then I started realizing that, well, there's really a lot of lessons here that I'm learning out while I'm surfing in the ocean that have much more to do with my life back on the beach than anything out here in the water. Yeah. You know, I've, I, growing up in Southern California, at a, as a young surfer, I started going up to Rincon, and I watched mm -hmm. Tom Curran 
go from being probably 14 years old into mm-hmm. who he, who he would become. And I I would watch him ride Rincon and 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 the uh the kind of elegant style that the wave brought out of him. And with you in the pipeline, I mean, have you ever thought that your your character might be different if your relationship was not with the pipeline, but instead a, a right-hand point break or some other break that was not what the pipeline was like reduced to in terms of the elements that were there? I wonder. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I do remember seeing, you know, pictures of or footage of, of Tommy surfing Rincon and just really um, – getting all warm inside you know yeah this watching the how he was you know really connected to that wave yeah and just everything he did there was it fit yes. you know and there was nothing extra it just was like perfect yeah there was such total harmony yeah and i just always remember that yeah. It's incredible though the breaks that we have long relationships with. I mean, they do they do weirdly shape us. I mean, I grew up surfing Malibu and I think paddling into a right hand wave at third point, second point, first point, and popping to my feet and turning right is one of the most natural things that I in my body. The the like cellular memory of that is so strong with thousands of waves having done that. But I would imagine with Pipeline you have that. I mean, right now we're sitting in San Clemente in a Hampton Inn alongside the 405 freeway or the 5 freeway. And you could, um, I would imagine in your mind, it, it went, it's not a big jump to just imagine paddling and jumping up and driving down the face and pulling into the tube. <laughs> well, in my dreams these days, I don't know if I could do it anymore. Uh-huh. But I certainly admire the the guys that do do it today. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's the beauty of surfing is that it has continued to evolve. Mm-hmm. And, you know, while at one time, you know, when I was at the pipeline that um, that was the beginning of something, um, every day is another beginning and, and that leads to something even better. Yeah. I just marvel at, at what all those guys do now, Jamie and John, John, you mm-hmm. know, the, the Brazilian kids, the, just all the, the guys that just live for that wave too, yeah. you know? Yes, absolutely. There's a thing that I've seen over the last couple of winters where there's almost, there's almost a sense of like playing with it, like taking off as late as you possibly can and sort of free falling down without much connection to the water at all. And, and yeah. then connecting before the lip slams you and pulling into it. <laughs> um, who are your heroes at this stage of your life? Are there people that you look up to? What's inspiring to you? Well, I mean, you know, all those young surfers. Kelly's just not so young anymore, but he's still right up there with the best of them. Um, you know, I love the young ones and the kids nowadays. I mean, I I watched a, a video of, I think he was only like, four or five years old this little kid he was the tiny little surfboard getting in the tube you know and Mm -hmm. just seeing him you know realizing that he was in the tube and just this you know expression on his face and in his body that he knew that moment that he was really trying for was actually happening yeah that's just the beauty of it is this the continuation mm-hmm. of this thing, you know. And, of course, surfing has grown so much. I mean, so far beyond what any of us ever imagined. I mean, you know, I think maybe Hobie had more vision than anyone. And I don't think he had any idea surfing was going to get as big as it did. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, here it is. and. You know, as crowded as the surf spots are, guys like you and me can still go out and catch a wave, you know, yeah. even if it's with a few other people on it and still have fun doing it. Yep. It's something that continues to make people feel good about themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the biggest buzz you get when you go surfing now? The biggest? The biggest buzz. What is the buzz? thing that you, you get from oh, it? Oh, that I can still get to my feet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's, you know, it's just, I mean, it's all about connecting with that, 
wave energy and and uh i think it adds up to something but i'm not sure what that is yeah you know like i said <laughs> all the best waves i can't remember any of them mm -hmm. i think for many surfers you know the the waves they ride the recollection of them is fleeting anyway yes that after a while you know they can't remember them either mm -hmm. but um it's still a beautiful thing good stuff jerry thank you you're welcome <laughs>